Christ, the Antichrist, actually establishes a state and conquers lands and rules from Jerusalem, unlike the person whom uh, we're claiming as the Messiah, which is Jesus. Jesus was unable to rule. The Antichrist is able to rule. And Jesus doesn't ascend the throne in Jerusalem. The Antichrist ascends the throne in Jerusalem. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, my brain can't handle it. It's true. It's Af it's it's really true. Uh, in the, in the apparent, it's just backwards sometimes, and you can't tell what's going on. Good to have you back. Thank you. So building upon what we spoke about in the last episode, which was uh, how to identify the Mahdi. Um, and we spoke about how the same way uh, to identify the Mahdi is it's, it's in line with the way it's actually the same method and the same way in which every prophet messenger, divinely appointed caliph, divinely appointed judge or king or priest is identified or known. Yes. And we we didn't call it this, but it, it could be called the law of knowing the proof of God or the law of recognizing the divinely appointed king or ruler. And we spoke about how it consists of three parts, and that is that uh, the person who is divinely appointed or the messenger from God has to come with a letter of appointment in which his name is mentioned on the tongue of his predecessor mm -hmm. or somebody who came before. Mm -hmm. Or he has to say, here's, here's my name in the, in, the, in the Holy Scriptures, you know, just like Jesus said my name was mentioned on the tongue of Isaiah. Or Muhammad said, my name was mentioned on the tongue of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to display that they have uh, superior divine knowledge. Okay. Yes. And uh, the third thing is that they have to be calling towards the supremacy of God. Yes. Right. That only God uh, rules. Uh, they cannot be calling towards any sort of system in which uh, people appoint or choose their own leader. Yes. So somebody might come and say, well, I don't know about all that. I don't know if, I'm not sure if that is the only way that we can identify whether or not somebody is divinely appointed or not. And so I thought that in this episode today, we can go through the stories of the prophets and the messengers and turn the pages of history and look at all of those people who actually failed and they ended up disbelieving or fighting or, or doubting in the divinely appointed messenger because they used a method other than what we mentioned to identify if the person was truly from God or not from God. Okay. Okay? Yes. All right. So uh, if let's talk about, for example... Uh, if somebody if somebody came and said, well, I'm not sure if that person is the Mahdi because, because he, I find that he has disobeyed God. Okay. Okay. Would the disobedience of the messenger of God, would the disobedience, the act of disobedience of a proof of God, uh, be sufficient of a reason to dismiss this person? Um, I, I, I would think that the answer is no, because he would have fulfilled all of these, you know, signs. And if he would have fulfilled that and then he would be the wrong person, then it would be like God is misguiding people. Uh, and I, I don't believe that God would do such a thing, but it would, of course, be, um, it would be, I guess, a shocking thing uh, to see. Is there a story? Uh, yeah, I think there's multiple stories, and okay. I'm also quite sure that you're aware of it if we were to bring it to your memory. And 
uh, we have we have, for example, the the act of God appointing Adam as yeah. his successor in the land. He yes. appoints him as a vice chair. He says, "Verily, I'm making a caliph in the land." He and now he makes all of the angels prostrate to Adam. Adam has authority over them. He's a hajj over them. He's a a messenger from God to them. And it's obligatory to obey Adam. Yes. And yet Adam himself disobeys God. Yeah. Uh, God tells him, don't approach the tree. And he actually does approach the tree. Yes. And so the, the story of creation, the story of the creation of mankind begins with an act of disobedience. And not just an act of disobedience from man, but, a, but an act of disobedience from a divinely appointed caliph. And if that story tells us anything, it tells us that once the person is divinely appointed, and certainly Adam was divinely appointed, God identifies him mm-hmm. and says, I'm making a caliph in the land. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, Adam is taught all of the names, right? So he's the most knowledgeable, and he displays this. God tells him, you know, to inform them of their names. Um and then you have Adam uh, calling towards or, or basically sitting at the head of the political system of God, and that is that he is uh, the, the caliph who's, who's uh, appointed, um, the ruler. And that story and, is very clear. And yet, even though he disobeyed, it wasn't sufficient of a reason for the angels to rebel against him. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think when you when you bring that that story into uh, when you explained, uh, would it be possible to to reject somebody based on the fact that they disobeyed God? Uh, I, I think we think of these stories uh, in a different way. We don't put them in this like modern context. But if you put the story of Adam in the modern context, it would be really shocking for people that God appointed Adam and then Adam disobeyed and. And uh, and yet, that's not a reason to disbelieve in Adam. No. It's very clear that Adam is still a good guy, and he was still a caliph of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And God, in the end, forgave him. Yes. So, if we learn anything from that story, we learn that um, we cannot judge the actions of the caliph of Allah, and even if he uh, commits an act of disobedience then that's between him and God. Now, we also have another example, and that's in the story of Yunus, Mm. alayhi salam. Yunus, or Jonah, um, his story is that he is preaching in the city. You remember which city? In Nineveh. Exactly. And the people aren't believing in him, and he's getting frustrated. So he he asks God to bring down the punishment upon them. God Mm. tells him, I'm going to be bringing down the punishment upon these people. In this hour, uh, Jonah goes forward and he begins warning the people and prophesizing that in this very hour, a punishment will come down upon you. And yet, the punishment doesn't come down in that hour. Mm -hmm. And Jonah is horrified because he feels like he's going to become a laughing stock amongst the people uh, in his city. And so he gets angry. Uh, with God. He doesn't understand the, the, the reason why God would do this, tell him one thing and then not fulfill his promise. He doesn't disbelieve in God, but he's angry at this and he decides that he's going to retire. He quits his job as a, as a messenger early and he runs away. Yeah. And leaves. And yet, God puts him through this amazing lesson and causes him to be swallowed by a whale and brings him this close to death and brings Jonah to his knees and causes Jonah to repent and God forgives Jonah and Jonah is spit out by the whale and he goes back to his city And then he understands the full wisdom of God. When he talks to the people of the city, the people of the city tell him that when you left, we saw the punishment shadowing us. And once the the clouds began to become dark 
and we heard the screeching of the winds, and we felt that God's wrath was going to touch us. We remembered your words, Jonah, and all of us repented and we fell into prostration. And then God removed his punishment, Mm -hmm. and now we're all believers in you. And everybody in the city, they celebrated Jonah and they welcomed him. And then Jonah realized in great shame in that moment that he had done a great injustice to God. He had thought that God had broken his promise when actually God didn't break his promise. It was because the people had repented and God ended up informing Jonah that his word is so true that that punishment which he promised upon them, it was supposed to come down, they repented. So God moved that away. But the punishment was still to come down in the future upon those people because out of their seed would it would become a disbelieving uh, nation. Mm. And so here we, we learn two great lessons from the story of Jonah. One is that a person cannot disbelieve once again in the messenger or doubt the messenger of God even if the messenger of God is seemingly doubting his message himself. Wow. Okay. That's a very, I mean, that's a crazy lesson from this story. But yes, that's exactly what the story is is teaching. I, you know, sometimes when we have these conversations, I feel like I I never thought deeply about what's really going on in these stories or um, how that would apply to to my life today. But yeah, if if you think about it, uh, you, you cannot doubt in God's messenger if he has proven himself uh, according to God's method, even if it seems like he he has run away or he has abandoned his mission or he has doubted in the mission himself. That's that's crazy. It is. I mean, it would, it would seem to the outside person that the people in the city of Nineveh were at one point had more faith in the, for sure they did, in the, in the punishment of God than Jonah did because Jonah was uh, was on the boat and he was angry and here the people they were in prostration and they saw the the punishment overshadowing them. Well, the second point that you can extract from the story, what do you think it is? Maybe that the people uh, were not misguided by Jonah. It was between Jonah and God, like ha- how you said the the first uh, the first point about Adam. The mistake was between Adam and God. And yeah, that's kind people- of covered in the first point, which okay. is that you know even if he's doubting, then you can't you can't disbelieve in them. But the second point that's fascinating in the story of Jonah is that the idea that even if a messenger promises that a punishment is going to come down oh my gosh and then the matter is delayed or it changes we cannot disbelieve in them yeah you're right you're right because it would seem like what he had said uh didn't come true and then people could have easily said he's a liar he doesn't know what he's talking about he's not with god but he was with god well, what if what if somebody decides to judge the caliph of Allah based on his physical fitness or his health? Is that is that a way to judge whether or not somebody is from God? Um, no, I mean, I wouldn't think so. No. Um, so there's a story of Job. There's the story of Job, and the story of Job is is one of my favorites because here you have a, a prophet messenger. And the people were looking at him, and they were supposed to be believing that, you know, that God's with him. And in the beginning, it's it's clear that God's with him. God's blessing him. Mm-hmm. He has lots of children. Yeah. He has lots of money. He has a beautiful wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's very happy. Uh, he has great land and lots of animals. And everybody and everything is healthy. And then overnight... Uh, because Satan decides that Job and his good attitude is driving him crazy. He can't stand it anymore. Yeah, mm-hmm. He thinks to himself, this is ridiculous. Job is only praising God because he has it so good. Why can't we test Job? And he, and he tells God, if you just take away these blessings that you gave him, 
instead of praising you, this ungrateful creature is going to curse you. I know these people. They're so ungrateful. Mm. And God decides to disprove Satan, to prove him wrong. And so God gives authority to Satan to come down and to strike uh, Job and his family. He causes his cattle to die. He causes his family to die. He takes away from Job everything. Yeah. Even his health. Yeah, he starts getting worms and like. Yeah, you know. he starts. He starts getting all of these boils, boils, and and he's so sick that he can barely move, mm. and his hair is falling out, and his teeth falling out, and he's becoming extremely thin. Yeah. And the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt Alayhi said that his out of the boils, there Job would look and he would see worms were emerging. Yeah. And and Job out of out he he could have pulled the worm out one narration stated, but instead he pushed the worm back in uh, into his body, saying that he refuses to uh, heal himself himself, that he only wants God to heal him. You know, he said God's the one. He talks to the worm. He says God's the one who commanded you to be there, so I'm not going to allow you to come out until God, uh, you know, heals me. His smell, the scent of Job, was putrid. It was something that was really horrifying. It was so bad that the people in the city that Job was living in, the narration state, they had to take him and they literally had to, you know, cover their their, their noses from the smell. And they took the messenger of Allah and they had to throw him out in the in the in the wasteland, the garbage area because for them, uh, he was obviously rotting to death and he was obviously like contaminating uh, the entire area. Wow. Wow. Like... But, but think about the test now. So Job had it rough and that was a really harsh test on, on it was a really rough and tough test on Job yeah. that Job had to maintain faith that God's with him and that he had received the curse of God. But imagine the companions of Job and the tests that they had or the people in the city that they had to continue maintaining faith in Job even though he was stricken with with worms and all of these diseases. Yes. That would be like, imagine us were approached by somebody who's claiming to be a Mahdi or we think that we're following in the time of Muhammad you know, we're, we follow Muhammad, imagine that. Yeah. And then Rasulullah or the Imam Mahdi or the second coming of Jesus, he comes. And then all of a sudden, um, overnight, they're stricken with boils and worms and, 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 and they can barely move. And it seems like God's angry with them. Yeah. How can a person maintain faith yeah. in that person? Yes, it's a huge, huge test of faith. I mean, if you imagine it, going through the same test today, it's. I, I think so many people would would fall, you know, would fall off of the truth because it is such a difficult test. And a lot of people in the time of Job did fall off the truth, yeah. and there was only a couple people that maintained uh, faith in him yeah. until God restored His blessings on Job and explained to him the uh, the wisdom behind. Uh, everything that he had gone through and, and gave him new children and new family and all that. Yeah. So I think that that to be able to pass tests like this um, is very difficult unless a person just holds on, has a certain law that they hold on to, whereby they're able to identify who the messenger is and then after they identify who the messenger is, they, no matter what happens, they stick by him. I mean, I think it's clear from these stories that it has to be like that, because if you judge based on their actions or even on how it appears that God's blessing them, it, you know, that's part of the journey of, of their, their mission. It doesn't always, it's not always apparent to us that, you know, that they, uh, that they are doing the right thing, like like these stories that we've mentioned with Adam, with Jonah, with Job. In the apparent, it would look like they themselves uh, must have fallen off the truth. But, yeah, so but, it's not allowed to disbelieve in Imam Mahdi once we find him, Yes. even if he disobeys God like Adam, mm -hmm. even if he runs away 
from God like Jonah, or he prophesied something and then it was delayed. Mm -hmm. um, and we have another example of the delaying of a punishment that takes place in the story of Noah and the yeah. Hadith, which is very famous, where uh, basically Noah tells the people that the flood's going to come, and uh, Gabriel comes down and he tells them to inform his people. He had lots of followers at the time. He tells them, take this date seed, plant it in the ground, tell your companions when the date seed becomes a date tree, the punishment's going to come, the flood's going to come, because they were always asking, when is the relief? When is the relief, Master yeah. Noah? And so they worked really hard. They built with him the ark. And then what happened? It, then it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Yeah. The punishment didn't come. And the people, they're looking around. They're looking at each other. They look over at Noah. They say, yeah, Noah, it's, you promised us that a flood was going to happen, and now it's not happening. Then Gabriel came down upon Noah and gave him a, another message to deliver to his people. He said to him, Noah, tell your people that it's okay because now this palm tree has given off fruits. Take one of the fruits, one of these dates, take the seed out. When you plant it in the ground, that seed will become a new palm tree and rest assured people, when the new palm tree becomes a full-grown palm tree, then the flood will happen. The people, when they heard this, um, they were terrified, and they split into three groups. A group that, you know, was convinced that Noah was the truth, no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the companion of the will. He's calling us towards, you know, the supremacy of God. He's displayed knowledge, amazing knowledge that we've heard from him. So we have no right to disbelieve in him no matter what happens. Yeah. A group of people that became full of doubt, you know, now they're not sure. Before they had certitude and no, no, they don't. And a group that disbelieved, see, because they used a different method other than the law of recognizing uh, the proof of God, the messenger of God, as a way of determining whether he was false or not false. They used the, the, the completion of his promise or the coming down of the punishment, the prophecy of Noah coming to pass, they used that as a scale whereby they can judge whether or not Noah was really from God or not. Then what happened? They went to hellfire. Yeah, wow. And then it continues, Tiffany. It continues 10 times that the palm tree becomes fully grown. It bears fruit. People wait for the punishment. It doesn't come down. And Gabriel comes down. Noah tells them, yeah, it's, it's actually going to be the seed uh, that, that happens uh, when the seed, you know, when I put the seed in the earth and it becomes a new palm tree. Happens a third time, fourth time, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, until the flood finally happens. That is, I mean, that's a huge test. That's a huge test on, on the believers. It does, and because their life is passing by in front of their eyes. They're getting older. They're, they've worked really hard. They had spent all this time with Noah, and Noah had an extremely long lifespan. And they thought to themselves, this guy's messing with us. He's lying to us. Every time we work for him, every time we listen to him, every time we wait all these years for the flood and the relief to happen, nothing happens. And he didn't just, it didn't just happen once. This happened like nine, ten times. And so by the time it got to the end, nobody had believed in Noah except for his family, his three sons and his wife. So that's how it was such a small group who got with him uh, on the ark. And yes. Wow. That is, that is a crazy story of, uh, of sifting and uh, of the danger of not following this like waterproof method is the only waterproof method. If you look at those three criteria, um, that's the only way. Because if but that you look at something opens, else... That also opens the door that the Mahdi could come and he could say, guys, hey, the punishment's going to come down upon humanity or the rise is going to happen or the divine just state's going to be established, you know, on this date or in this year. And then if it doesn't happen, we, we can't disbelieve in the Mahdi. It's not a reason. 
You're right. You're absolutely right. There's all there's all of these expectations of uh, of the Mahdi, and and uh, I I know some people have have commented or or said things like I'll I'll believe when I see it, or I'll believe based on the outcome, or I'll believe when the punishment comes, or you know these things. But if you if you wait for such a thing, uh, you you open the door to to being completely wrong. Uh, as as these people were, they left the truth because they were waiting for for signs to be fulfilled, and that's that's actually not how God works. Yeah, He can delay, and that's why the Ahlul Bayt Salam they have a hadith that says if we say something about somebody, that for example, this person something he's going to do something, or something's going to happen to him, uh, but then it doesn't happen to him. Mm -hmm. But it happens to his son or his son's son, then don't deny it. All right? If we say something about a man and it's not in him, but it's in his son or his son's son, then don't deny it. So that's the same idea behind the palm tree story. Yeah. That God's promise is true. It is true even in the sense that it was by proxy uh, that seed, that when it grew into a full palm tree, the punishment happened. Mm -hmm. It was just the seeds, 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 okay. right? Yeah. That that caused that that flood to take place. Yeah. So if an Imam Mahdi comes to us and he says that something's going to happen and then it doesn't happen, we have to remain holding on to him because it could happen the year after or the year after that or the year after that or the year after that times 10 or more. Yeah. Yeah. If the Mahdi comes to us and he's stricken with, with a disease, if he has cancer, if he has boils, if he gets infested with worms, if his smell is putrid, uh, are these reasons to disbelieve in him? Maybe if God didn't establish on us the proof beforehand and tell us the story of Job, but after the story of Job, there's no excuse. Yeah, you're right. The, the stories were preserved. What if the Mahdi came and he had like a, 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 a disloyal wife, uh, a wife that was uh, sleeping around or she was betraying him, uh, betraying the, the bed? Would, would that be a reason why a person could disbelieve in the Mahdi? I mean, no, because Noah's wife was known to be a disloyal wife. And his Lot's wife And Lot's also. wife, yes, as well. She was also a, a, a disbelieving woman. She okay, turned but into then, a but we also soul. have in the in the Old Testament an example of a prophet who was sent, who had an extremely disloyal wife. Mm -hmm. Do you know who? Oh, yes, Hosea. Hosea. Yeah. Tell us the story of Hosea, Tiffany. Um, Hosea, he he was the prophet uh, of God, and he was calling the people to to worship God. And the people were disloyal to God. The people were, were worshiping other than God. And Hosea was actually uh, asking God to destroy these people. He said, they're bad. Uh, they're disloyal to you. And, uh, and He was an Israelite prophet. Yes, an Israelite prophet. And, um, and God decided to teach Hosea a lesson in his own life, uh, like a metaphorical lesson for, for what he was saying. So he caused him to, to get married to a woman. And the woman was disloyal to him. The woman was sleeping around. Uh, she had children. He didn't even know uh, if the children were, were his, but he loved this woman. He loved her so much. He was attached to her. And then God told him one day to, to divorce this woman. And he felt this, uh, this pain uh, because because of the love that he had for her, even though she was disloyal. And the whole thing was a metaphor for him to understand God's love of the, the Israelites, because even though they were disloyal to him and worshiping other than him, just like uh, Hosea's wife had been disloyal to him, God still loved them and didn't want Hosea to want their destruction. He wanted that Hosea help them, you know, to, to come back to him. Wow. So that's that's quite a test too, because then the people were forced on the outside, though, because they didn't understand the logic. A lot of the people that believed in Hosea, they didn't know that Hosea was praying for their destruction. Yeah. Right. 
Um, a lot of people that believed in Hosea, or at least like were familiar or heard him. Now, here's a guy who's claiming that he's a prophet of God. They look, who's his wife that he's walking with? And they're like, oh my God, this, this woman, we see her all the time. She's with other men. Yeah. If this guy is really a prophet, how can he even remain with her? Yeah. He doesn't even know. God didn't even tell him what his own family's doing, what his own wife's doing uh, behind his back. So how is he going to be bringing to us news from the unseen? Well, so they were judging him based on, based on her. Yeah. yeah. And many of them disbelieved in him based on her. And that serves as a lesson, too, that we can't disbelieve in the messenger of God or the divinely appointed king based on his family or the actions of his family or whom he's married to or whom he's associated with. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, that's, a, that's a very clear example. What other yeah. examples do we have of, of things that happened with prophets and messengers that could cause people to doubt and why we can't judge their actions? So. We have an interesting story, Moses and the righteous servant. Yeah. What happens there? Uh, Moses, he, he thinks that he's the most knowledgeable, so uh, God tells him to go on a journey and meet this character called the righteous servant. Yes. And uh, he takes along with him Joshua Benun, and they, they go. Um, I think that in the Quran, it's actually speaking about a, like a, like a young man who's who's accompanying him. Yes, and um, they go on this journey, and the righteous servant he says, uh, "You won't be able to be patient with me." And Moses is like, "No, I, I I have the determination. I have the patience." So so three things happen in that journey um, that cause Moses to be shaken, and actually, uh, you know, he 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 is lacking patience. So uh, it involves actually some very, very heavy uh, testing. He, at one point... So before we get to the tests, now we have Moses, who's a messenger of God. Mm -hmm. And there's another messenger of God that's sent to this messenger of God. So now Moses, his position shifts from being the person who's the more knowledgeable to the person who's being the less knowledgeable. He's the one who's being tested now. He, by uh, another messenger of God, and it's obligatory for Moses to maintain faith. And the story of the righteous servant and Moses is, it's really one big lesson to tell us that no matter what the actions are of the messenger of God, you can never disbelieve in them. Yeah. And he displays this through these three important stances that take place. What is the first stance? So there's there's a boat. They come across some people. Yeah. They're poor. They're in a boat. Um, the righteous servant uh, takes Moses. They're trying to cross uh, the river. Uh, they say to the people, hey, will you give us a ride? And the people are very welcoming. They don't charge them. They welcome them onto the ship. And as they're sailing on the ship, Moses looks down and he's horrified because he finds that the righteous servant is actually causing a... Yeah. He's, he's, he's destroying the ship. Yeah. He's making a hole in the ship so that water comes in. Yeah. Uh, Moses is like, what are you doing? You're, you're drowning the ship and these nice people after they after they welcomed us on their ship free of charge, how could you do such a horrible thing? Yeah. And the righteous servant says, Moses, are you doubting in me? Did I not tell you that you were not going to be patient enough? And he kind of reminds him that what you're doing right now is unacceptable. Just because you're seeing me do something that your mind cannot comprehend, just because I am in the apparent breaking one of the laws of God, which is destruction of the property of a, of a neighbor. Uh, you don't have the right to judge me because I know best. Yeah? Yeah. So Moses repents, and he realizes that, that actually, yes, he, he, he already confirmed the identity of this person, that he was appointed by God, 
the person is more knowledgeable. He knows that. And uh, that, you know, according to the system of the supremacy of God, that the righteous servant is an authority figure over him. He's an appointed king or or uh, ruler over him. So he has to submit uh, to him and not question. They continue going along. And what happens next? Um, they come to, to some children. They right? come to a child and yeah. they see him and he's playing. They see him, he's playing, and the righteous servant takes a rock and he goes up to a little in boy. Some, in some narrations, he strikes him with a rock. and another narration, uh, he calls for him to come forward and he pets the kid on the head and then he smashes his head against a large uh, stone. And while the child leans back backwards, the righteous servant pulls out a knife and slaughters uh, the child in front of Moses. At this point, Moses is completely shocked. He cannot keep his mouth shut. His face goes pale. Yeah. He is, he right now, one of the greatest crimes that a person can commit is murder. And, and, and you're not just committing murder, but you're killing an innocent soul, a child who didn't even reach uh, puberty. Yeah. How is this justifiable? He, questions the righteous servant. He's like, what are you doing? This is horrible. Yeah. The righteous servant looks at him, shakes his finger. He says, did I not tell you that you're not going to be patient? You know, here you are. You're questioning me again one more time. If this happens, you know, and the, the story is done. It's actually Moses that says, I'm sorry. Let me continue with you. And if I question you one more time, then, then that's it. You can let me go. Yeah. And they continue going, yeah. and they come across what? Um, a wall. Well, yeah, a wall yeah. in the city. Yeah. And in the city, the people are very rude to them. They're nasty. They're mocking them. They're not offering them any shelter, not offering them uh, any food. They're very evil people. And then the righteous servant sees this wall that's damaged. What does he do? He repairs it. He goes over there, he rolls up his sleeves, and he starts to repair the wall. Moses goes over there, and he thinks to himself, my God, yeah, this guy, the people that offered us a ride free of charge, he destroys the ship. Yeah. An innocent child who has no sin upon him, he bashes his head into a rock and slaughters him. And these evil people over here, he's, he's, he's honoring them. He's working for them free of charge. Yeah. So he musters up enough courage. He's like, hey, you know, you could have charged for your labor. And when he said that, the righteous servant stops what he's doing. He looks at him. He says, okay, this is the end of the journey between me and you. Now I'm going to explain everything to you. He says, as for the hole that I made in the ship, the reason why I made that hole was because there was a tyrannical king who was sailing at sea, and he was seizing everybody's properties. And so I wanted to, to, to put a malfunction in the ship so that he would look at it and not want it. He wouldn't want to bother his, waste his time with such a ship. Yeah. So actually, I was safeguarding the property of those poor people. I was doing them a favor. And as for the boy, the boy was evil, and he would have grown up to make his parents disbelieve and make them extremely tired out of his tyranny. So it was actually an act of mercy for the parents that I killed this child, because the child, it was like a baby Hitler or something. And I was saving them from going through that heartache, and God would replace that child with a righteous one. And as for this wall, there was a treasure that was underneath the wall, and it belonged to two orphans in the city. And, and I wanted to basically safeguard and protect that treasure uh, from being found by the disbelievers in this city, and that's why I was repairing the wall. 
Yeah, that's that's an amazing story. Like such a plot twist at the end that it was actually uh, like he knew what we didn't know. Exactly. And he knew what we couldn't see. And so, what 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 can we uh, you know extract from the story? We can extract that even if the Imam Mahdi came, or the Messenger of God came, and he's destroying people's property, or in the apparent we think that he's oppressing somebody. That we can't judge, yeah. and that's not a reason to disbelieve in him. Yeah. If he commits murder, even against a child, uh, that would not even be sufficient of a reason to disbelieve in him. Oh. If we find him helping uh, people that we would consider to be disbelievers, you know, or evil people, if he comes, for example, and he's he's defending homosexuals, or he's doing something that we would consider to be uh, not righteous because these people are bad people. Uh, we also cannot take that as a reason to disbelieve uh, in that person. Yeah. And we look over to the story of Moses, and we also find that Moses was actually uh, guilty of murder too. Yeah. And he was an outlaw. He was a fugitive. So even if the, the Mahdi has a criminal record, or he was a fugitive on the run, accused of murder, like Moses, even then it wouldn't be enough of a reason to disbelieve in him. Wow. Wow. I mean, when you put all these stories, uh, you know, in, in, in context, it's just, it's so interesting to think what it means for Imam Mahdi, how we absolutely cannot judge based on all of these things, which so many people would disbelieve because of them. So many people would say this can't be from God. Just like even Moses himself couldn't believe what the righteous servant was doing. And yet that would be wrong because this is the person who got appointed. This exactly. is the person who is fulfilling God's divine law that he gave us to know who is the right person to follow. Uh, it's amazing. So here's one of my favorites. Are you ready? Yes. One of my favorites is the trial that the companions of Jesus had to go through. Yeah. Now here they are, they're Jewish, right? Yeah. What are they waiting for? Messiah. The Messiah. What's the Messiah supposed to do? Build like a, a kingdom of God, a divine Build a state, divine yeah. just day, right? He's supposed to rule. Yeah. Uh, the Messiah for the Jews was like Imam Mahdi for the Muslims. Yeah, he's supposed yeah. to change everything he's supposed for supposed to them. change everything. So here they are, they're waiting, and then all of a sudden comes Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Jesus establishes the proof upon them. Mm -hmm. He says, I mentioned on the tongue of Isaiah. He's showing and displaying amazing knowledge. He's even displaying miracles, yeah. and he's calling towards the supremacy of God, and they pledge allegiance to him, and they believe in him. Yeah. And they're waiting for that promised day. Yeah. The promised day that he would rise and rule from Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. He would be a king that was like, like David, and much greater. And then what happens? Three years, Tiffany, three years into the Dawah, after, three years after Jesus uh, began to publicly proclaim his message, uh, he's betrayed by his companion. Yeah. He's arrested. Okay? Yeah. Uh, he can't escape arrest. Uh, he's tortured. Yeah. And he's driven to the cross. He's condemned. Yes. And right? People witness and in him. the apparent, yeah. they all witness him being executed. He's yeah. crucified. Right? Yeah. And then their Messiah is no more. He's done. Yeah. Wow. I know. And he didn't do anything that they thought he was going to do. Nothing. Yeah. And three years is nothing. Three years is so short. I mean, yeah. It, like he barely had enough time to amass believers in that time. And so what does that mean then? Does that mean that Jesus is not the Messiah? Certainly, probably some people in that time believed that. They they probably disbelieved in him because but, of that. But, but in reality, for sure, most of the people disbelieved him. Even even his own disciples, yes. even his own successor, yeah. Simon Peter, he denied, denied him. him yeah. yeah, because denied he was him arrested. Three times. Yeah. yeah, after he was arrested and yeah. taken off, it was like, a, and they, they went back to their normal lives. They were fishing, they were like... They were heartbroken. They thought yeah. that the story was done. They thought that they had been misguided. Yeah, they did, yeah. Yeah. They, they were hiding away, they, they, they were so confused. And these were the people who saw him perform so many miracles, 
They, and yet they, he remained the Messiah. Yes, he did. And yet we know that that there's no other Messiah that would be sent to Israel except for Jesus. Yeah, he was And it. that's what all the Christians proclaim today, right? Yeah. Yes. And that's what all the Muslims proclaim today, yes. right? So the Muslims and the Christians, these billions of people, they are confessing, maybe without realizing, that even if God sent a messenger to rule and establish a divine just state, even if he was incapable or he didn't establish that divine just state, it doesn't matter. You still have to believe in him. He's still the Messiah. He's still the king. Yes. That's like sending an Imam Mahdi, and the people are waiting on this Imam Mahdi to establish a divine just state, and then he doesn't. Yeah. And he doesn't have a rise. And he doesn't fight against any countries. And he doesn't do anything of the things that he was that was said that he would do. He doesn't spread justice. He doesn't spread equity. He doesn't do anything. Yeah. So even if that happened, but he can't disbelieve. You can't disbelieve in the fact that he was the Mahdi. Why? Because it already happened before with the Israelites and Jesus. And so if it happened with the Muslims in the Mahdi, then that would still be no excuse for them to disbelieve. Yeah. I mean, that's a very big deal. That's a very, that's a very, that's a shocker. And how do the Christians and the, and the, and the Muslims justify it? They say, oh, well, there's going to be a second coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's going to come in the future, and then he's going to fulfill the promise. Mm -hmm. Well, that's still very problematic because that means that if the Mahdi comes and the people believe that he's the Mahdi, and then he doesn't do anything of what the Mahdi, what it, what it said that the Mahdi would do, that he still could be the Mahdi because maybe he also is going to have a second coming. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it would be logical. Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, you can't deny it. <laughs> There's actually no way to argue against what you just said. It's very heavy, isn't it? And yeah, it is. It's. I mean, you. I think you you presented a lot for people to, to contemplate deeply because. It, now, I I just want to you know say for the sake of saying it in front of our viewers that, uh, and this is not what I'm stating will happen. There will be no second coming for the Mahdi. The Mahdi will accomplish what he's supposed to accomplish in this lifetime. But I'm just saying that even if he didn't, it wouldn't be a reason to disbelieve in him because there is no scale whereby a person can judge if he is a messenger from God or not, except for the scale or the law of knowing or recognizing uh, the proof. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, if we if we take that we don't just believe that who that Jesus was who he uh, said he was the Messiah because of tradition or because you know it's been taught to us, we we have to go back and and look at how he proved it and how he proved it was exactly what you're saying. These three criteria: the law of knowing, the proof of God, and not these other things that people use to to judge the messenger of God. But what if the Mahdi came and, and he changed the direction of prayer from Mecca to somewhere else? Would that be a reason to disbelieve in him? I mean, you're, you're making me think of Prophet Muhammad, who, who also did that. He changed the direction of prayer from Jerusalem to Mecca. Yeah. It had always been that the direction of prayer was in Jerusalem. And the Prophet Muhammad in the beginning of his da'wah, he's actually telling the Muslims that this is the direction in which we must pray. And then in the middle of his da'wah, he switches it, and it goes from Jerusalem to Mecca. Mm -hmm. And that was not an excuse for the people to disbelieve in him, even though many did disbelieve in him after that. Um, so the Mahdi, or the person who is appointed by God, he could even change laws change holy sites, change rules, and that would still not be a reason to disbelieve in the Mahdi. Wow. I, I mean, it's, it's all been presented before in religious history, actually, when you think about it. Um, 
yeah. It, all of these things are not justifiable reasons to disbelieve in the Mahdi. I, I'm, I'm really amazed by all of these stories, when you put them all together, uh, it's very clear that there's really only one way to, to know who the Mahdi is, and then once you do know, you can't go back on that. Now you have to stick to it. Yeah. And it is extremely scary, but it also shows the importance uh, that of God leaving, why, why God had to have left a clear way that we can identify who his messenger is, because if we were left to our own logic, or left to our own feelings, or, or we use those feelings and logic as a judge, um, or a, a, a way whereby we can determine if this person is truthful or not, we would, we would definitely fail every single time. If we didn't have the law of knowing the proof of God, if his name, the name of the messenger wasn't mentioned in a will, and uh, then we would be we would be left in a state of chaos because we would look upon Adam and say, um, Adam is not worthy of of being followed because he himself is disobeying God. Why would I obey God? when the person telling me to obey God and himself is disobedient. Um, I wouldn't follow Noah because I wouldn't have the patience to. Every time he tells me that something's going to happen, it's not happening. Uh, his prophecies are always coming up, you know, uh, turning out to be false, right? Yeah. So I would dismiss him and I would, I would fail. I would look at a prophet like Jonah, and I would think to myself, uh, well, um, you know, he's clearly abandoned his mission. Why would, why would I stick to it? Why would I continue to have faith in the fleeing messenger? Um, if I was to see Hosea, I would think to myself, wow, uh, he's, he chose a very nasty uh, prostitute to get married to. How can I believe that this person is divine and holy? when so much evil exists within his own household, um, I would dismiss him. I would disbelieve. If I saw the actions of the righteous servant and the actions of Moses, uh, both who were murderers, I would, I would think to myself, maybe these people are not merciful. Uh, how can God command such evil? How can God break his own commandments? Um, and I would dismiss them. If I saw that, you know, Jesus basically was arrested and crucified, I might think to myself, instead of him being a Messiah, this is a punishment that befell upon him. This is not somebody who I should follow. Clearly, God was upset with him, and I would dismiss him. If I saw Job, I would dismiss him because I would think to myself, you know, uh, he can't even heal himself physically. How can he heal us spiritually? and I would dismiss him, right? If I saw the actions of the Prophet Muhammad who comes to the people and he starts switching and changing and implementing new laws that were never heard of before and calling the people to new directions of worship, I would also become frightened, maybe uneasy, and dismiss him. All if I was left to use my brain and my heart in determining if this person was from God. Even miracles, Tiffany, are not a way to determine whether or not the person's truly from God or not from God. And we, we know that is the case because, because in Christianity and in Islam, the Antichrist, uh, the son of Satan, one of the most evil people that will ever exist, is able to perform every single miracle that the greatest miracle worker from God did, and that is uh, Jesus. Uh, the Antichrist is able to, to create things and to give life to the dead and to cause the heavens to bring forward its rain, and he's able to sustain, and he comes walking with heaven and hell with him, and he's bringing people back to life and, and loved family members, and he has 
uh, demons that are posing as angels uh, that are coming along with him. So, yes. so mm-hmm. how how then can we use uh, the miracle to determine if he's true or false? Anybody who would come forward with miracles alone, automatically you would have a group of people that would believe in them and say he's from God, and you would have the opposing group that would disbelieve in them and saying it's because of the fact that he's doing these things that he is the Dishad or the Antichrist. Right? Yes, it's a big ball of confusion, like for sure. And the way you're describing the Antichrist, it seemed it would appear that God is with him more than he was with somebody like Job, who God actually was with, because Job wasn't able to miraculously heal himself, as you said. You know, he's here suffering, and then we've got this guy who's performing miracles and he's sustained, and it looks like God is with him, but actually he's the Antichrist. So I guess that's just the danger of using or relying on your own judgment or your own ability to perceive exactly. if somebody is from God. If we say that that these are all ways that a person can determine and, and we disbelieve in the law of knowing or recognizing the proof of God, then we're really making an excuse and saying that the people that follow the Antichrist are not to blame. You know why? Because Antichrist, the Antichrist, actually establishes a state and conquers lands and rules from Jerusalem unlike the person whom uh, we're claiming as the Messiah, which is Jesus. Jesus was unable to rule. The Antichrist is able to rule. And Jesus doesn't ascend the throne in Jerusalem. The Antichrist ascends the throne in Jerusalem. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, my brain can't handle it. It's true. It's Af- it's it's really true. Uh, in the, in the apparent, it's just backwards sometimes, mm-hmm. and you can't tell what's going on uh, unless you use something. Like God wouldn't just leave us with no. nothing. So that's why the, the 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 law or the yeah the law of recognizing the proof of God is so important because it, if you hold on to it, it's like this rope that will save you from misguidance, even in, this, in, even in situations and in trials and tribulations, in confusing uh, points that make you think that good is evil or evil is good, um, you still know where to go because you've held on to the companion of the will. Because... Uh, None of the false prophets, even the Antichrist himself, none of them, they come forward claiming uh, that their name is in a will. Uh, None of them come forward and they uh, have that in addition to knowledge, in addition to the uh, banner of supremacy as to God. So, So God made it extremely clear that there is a way to recognize who it is that he sent. And this is detailed out in the Torah and the Bible and in the Quran. Yeah. And these are the only things that a false person cannot come with. And, and a true person has to come with that. It's very clear. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Tiffany. And uh, inshallah, we'll have future episodes where we'll talk about uh, some more amazing things. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and uh, I can't wait to continue.